my words about Colin will be brief, not just because of the few minutes assigned to each of us, but because I have chosen to talk about some small, humble, humble and sweet aspects of the friendship I had with Colin. Not having been his student or having worked with him in any capacity, I feel almost inadequate to speak, but much honored nevertheless. I am humbled by those extended and intense relations we have heard about this afternoon, and as a result, I shall be brief. Since we all know what Colin achieved, the importance of his intellectual brilliance and his revelatory capacities, I will instead address other, more personal aspects. As I told Judy when she called to ask me to be here, I am fully untrained in this type of service and have felt, consequently, unsure about what to say. In the true south, where I come from, there are funerals and friends go to church with the body present more often than not, the clan family, and then they proceed after that to have lunch and family. That's all, not much in public is said after the death. Uh, I should begin then by narrating how it all started in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, in the early 70s. But really, I need to go back further than that, because Colin first impacted my intellectual life through his writings. In the 1960s, a friend in Buenos Aires gave me a bunch of bibliograph pages. This was before Xerox was invented. Those bluish pages that turn yellow over time. There's enough mature people here that will remember them. These pages were the mathematics of the ideal villa, which I painfully read with the help of a dictionary, you can imagine that. As it did for many others, it changed my understanding of architecture forever. Back to 1974, Jorge Silvetti and I had begun to teach at Carnegie Mellon, and one of us was in charge of the lecture series. Colin was the first person in the country we thought of inviting. I picked him up at the airport with my car, in whose back were packed some pieces of modern steel furniture and a few early industrial domestic objects, like appliances, like 1940s ice crushers, juice mats, and things of that kind. He began to talk about them with great animation, to my surprise, I didn't know, and of course with immense wit. Later on, Colin came to the house, saw the things we were then buying, and was excited by them. We had click, and a good fun was had by all. I think he was intrigued by our origin and our openness, but most of all, by the objects around us. That mark can set the tone to our friendship. For the next 25 years, we will talk mostly about furniture, particularly their legs. Susie talked about legs, too. <laughs> but we went beyond that. Long conversations were about a sabot, that is to say, the little shoe on a French leg. We talk as well about objects of all kinds, from grand tour mementos to Regency cups and saucers, particularly the big Russian ones for hot chocolate with painted scenes. I learned immensely, and it was always amusing, to say the least. Of course, it was more than that. It was about cultures, conventions, taste, style, history, manners, or more specifically, about Prussian royal families, European princesses exiled to Switzerland or Rome, Borbonic dynasties in Calabria, etc. It was about her hermeneutics and exegesis, and above all, cultural criticism, before the concept became popular. It certainly was not about semiology, which he considered naive and pretentious, and at that time, and which I already had already abandoned. We all know how much he enjoyed reading memoirs, biographies, and intimate journals. This knowledge allowed him to make the most precise and revealing connections among objects and subjects, true or untrue. These were library type of conversations, the book come open on the table kind of times, after dinner conversations, a time followed by the night calls that some of us have spoken about, and a sizable stack of yellow pad letters, term typed. He really was not good at typing. <laughs> um, letter over letter without moving the thing. Um, <laughs> there were other type of conversations as well, to be bland, conversations had while shopping. The fact was Colin and I shopped well together. In the late 70s, he began to visit Boston often for lectures at RISD or Harvard because of other friends who moved to Boston or to look after his health. Often he stayed with us and enjoyed still a good walk. The antiquarians on Charles Street became our favorite hunting grounds. I bargained for him, he liked that. He bought, and sometimes I carried. I specifically remember a rather tall and heavy secretary of a tante I took to Ithaca one spring weekend 
with a rented van which we later used to circle Cayuga Lake, admiringly looking at America's Greek revival houses. I certainly knocked at the trees since we both were equally more what we call plant material. And then there were the conversations about interiors and much commentary in the manner of Mario Pras, to whom a colleague introduced me. It was indeed fun. After shopping sprees, we would return to the house walking along Marlborough Street at dusk or at night. The rooms were lit, the curtain not yet drawn, and one could see everything, three floors of it on both sides of the street, much to Colin's delight. His commentary then became riotous, unstoppable, a continuous, contagious chuckle. How could they have that, he would say, or feigning, <laughs> or feigning embarrassment. Don't look, it's too ghastly. <laughs> Significantly enough, we never discussed architecture directly, and I believe that was a relief for Colin. I realize I talk about these little moments with positive pleasure. I, I treasure them and consider myself lucky for what they gave me. With Colin, the seemingly superficial became deep, and the minor highly significant, and I agree with sens his sensitivity. I should say that the comforting and good thing about people as strong and unique as Colin is that they are truly unforgettable and that they don't, ev don't quite leave us, ever. The other day I was in Paris walking the old furniture markets looking at mid-20th century French furnishings and I could hear Colin chuckling at the oddity of some piece of the core or at something excessive. Sometimes I f find myself asking, I ask myself, in those circumstances, what would Colin think about this or that, within which interpretations of reactive or reactions could a piece prompt? These are signs of existence. In our mind, uh, Colin remains endearingly as ever.